good afternoon everyone uh, all participants and a uh, very warm welcome to our dialogue today and uh, given all these circumstances hope uh, you all are happy healthy and safe and your families are happy healthy and safe too uh, let me put the sc screen share on so you can uh, while i go through the slides uh, you can actually at the same time can everyone see my screen yes Okay, so uh, let's go straight into, as uh, Amir Rana said, uh, this is today's topic. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it. screen is not moving. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, no, it, I can't. Why the screen is not shifting? That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, yeah, now. So it's a, a customarily brief uh, introduction uh, to OPP. Uh, which stands for Overseas Progressive Pakistanis, uh, based in the Netherlands and working across uh, Europe and beyond. Uh, our, the purpose of uh, our organization, as we described it when we started four years ago, OPP is a platform for the people of Pakistani origin to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. It says Pakistani origin to give it an identity, a frame, but actually everyone is welcome. Our vision is the unity in diversity, which is very much on the today's topic. The mission as we have uh, described it or explained it is we strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues. And one of the dialogues is happening today and part of our program. Our inclinations, our political inclination is we believe in democracy, human rights, minority rights and gender equality. Religiously, we see separation of the state from religion, and this is again happens to be today's topic. Uh, socially, we believe in integration, tolerance, acceptance, and harmony. Now, back to, to today's topic, uh, and uh, there has been a lot of discussion about this topic uh, uh, while building up to today's dialogue. And there have been some, some misconceptions, sometimes maybe misunderstandings, if you wish. So I would like to just spend a, literally a few seconds to, to set the framework for today's discussion. It is not about religion. I think there was some kind of probably misunderstanding among a few people that we will be discussing religion or religions today. So it is absolutely not our purpose today to dis discuss any religion for that matter. Uh, what it is about, it's about a uh, relationship between the state and the religion and its impact on society. Uh, democracy, equality, uh, coexistence, etc., 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 and this relationship, as the topic suggests, has been continuously evolving, changing. If we look at uh, different societies' history, we see that this has been changing. The the, the relationship between uh, whether we take Pakistan, India, Europe, uh, Bangladesh, doesn't matter which country, we have seen some kind of uh, shifting in these relationships. Then this is about understanding the dynamics in societies which have a state religion on which we which don't have a state religion. And what are the fundamental differences uh, between these two kinds of societies? And as we know, there are sometimes uh, states which have religion, but societies are much more uh, uh, secular in that sense. And sometimes it's vice versa. I mean, if we take the example of uh, Pakistan, we see that uh, the state tends to be probably more theocratic than the people. Uh, and we will come to that uh, later, I am sure. Uh, start with a, let me just, with a, with a quote from uh, uh, Abhijit Naskar, very familiar to most of you. He says, he pr pretty well sums up actually today's topic. The point is, being a Christian does not mean hating or belittling the non-Christians. Being a Muslim does not mean hating or belittling the non-Muslims. Being an atheist even does not mean hating or belittling the religious people. In a civilized society, diversity in religious orientation should be the reason for celebration, not the cause for hatred and differentiation. Now, having said that, let me give you very briefly because to make sure that we all start from the same base. Uh, what is secularism? And there are many definitions, rather misinterpretations of, uh, of the word secularism for political reasons, for other reasons. According to Cambridge, 
the belief that religion should not be involved with the ordinary social and political activities of a country. Very simple, straightforward definition. However, the National Secular Society defines it as separation of religious institutions from state institutions and public sphere where religion may participate, but not dominate. So all religions can participate, not one religion will dominate. They will have a kind of equal standing. Second is freedom to practice one's faith or belief without harming others or change it, not have one according to one's own conscience. So it's, it's up to individuals. Equality so that our religious beliefs or lack of them doesn't put any of us at an advantage or a disadvantage. So this is the, the premise, if you wish, uh, the definition of secularism as we will go ahead. There are some myths I want to, to share with you before we, we, we uh, come to the to the actual topic. Uh, there are several myths. I've just listed a few. Uh, first and mostly used uh, is that secularism is anti-religion. And it's absolutely not true. I mean, if there is a religious freedom in any society, it is a secular society because the secularism, as you saw in the definition, they do see all religions like equal and they do believe in freedom of all religions. So it is, it, it's just a myth, it's not, not true. Uh, second, which follows it is that all seculars are atheists. That's not true either. I'm sure you all know, I know that uh, we have many friends who are religious, very much religious, but they are secularists. Yeah, there are some atheists as well who are secularists, but not every secular is an atheist. Secularism is about uh, giving freedom equal freedom to all religions. Secular and spirituality can't go, go together. That's also a myth. I mean, we see if all religions are free, whether it's Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, whether it's Darga, whether it's yoga, everyone is, to, is free to exercise their spirituality in their own way. Other myth is secularism has been vicious in some cases like Nazi Germany or even Soviet Union is mentioned as an example or North Korea. It's also not true because uh, we all know very well from the history that Nazi Germany was never a secular state. Even Soviet Union, North Korea, they were not by constitution secular states, they were atheist states. I mean, actually in Nazi Germany, the free thinkers have been prosecuted in big numbers. We, we all know that. Then comes secular societies are shallow and consumerist. It's not true either. We have seen many uh, religious societies, uh, capitalist societies in general, which are shallow and consumerist it has nothing to do with, with the, it has to do with the economy it has not to do with the with the faith or belief of the people and secularism is just another ideology that's had its day actually that's also not true because it is be becoming more relevant as the history evolves so in in a nutshell religion and secularism are not mutually exclusive they can very very uh, nicely peacefully live uh, side by side or together so that was just a brief introduction, just, just to, to kind of warm up, if you wish, and uh, our speaker today. We are extremely lucky to welcome uh, Dr. Parvez Udbhai uh, And uh, I think, uh, what can I say to introduce him? It actually, everyone knows him. And uh, I wouldn't do justice, whatever I say. Uh, but just, just to, to, to do formal introduction, one of, he is one of Pakistan's most prominent academics, and we see that every day in talk shows, on the TV, in, no, in newspapers, dons, articles, discussions. He has been a big promoter, really a dedicated promoter of freedom of speech, speech secularism, education, and women's rights. He writes and speaks extensively obsessively on topics ranging from science and Islam to education, to disarmament issues around the world. He is author of the famous Islam and science, religious orthodoxy and the battle of rationality. He writes regularly on science and social issues in the national and international media. So please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Parvez Udbai. Very fortunate to have you today, very lucky to have you. And the floor is yours or the microphone is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much, Wahid Saab. And with this uh, introduction to secularism, it's so impressive that I don't know how much I'll be able to add on to this. Let's go back a bit and look at the kinds of societies that exist today in the world. And I'd say that there are 
two broad categories. On the one hand, you would have those who take their laws in consonance with religion and tradition. These one would call the religious societies or the, or the non-secular societies. And the insistence has been that everything that relates to what we do must be derived from either religion or from tradition. And then there are those that uh, insist that laws must change according to a society's present needs and in the present times, that there is no holy text, that humans need to go out and discover the world and then make rules, laws as suits them at that moment in time. So these are what we call secular societies. Now, um, as you very correctly said, there is uh, in in uh, traditional uh, in non-secular societies, the source of inspiration can either be from above, so it could be a religious text, or it could be a text which is considered non-alterable. And among the non-alterable texts would be either uh, Mein Kampf or it could be Das Kapital. And so if these are laws that are given and if the ideology contained in them is fixed, permanent, unchangeable, then we shall agree not to call them secular societies, although they may or may not have a religion. The questions that you wanted me to address was whether countries that, whether states that are theocratic can be democratic. That is those in which laws are given as being unchangeable, whether you can have a true exercise of the will of the people, which is what we call democracy. You also asked me to, to raise the question, can all people in a non-secular society, in a theocratic society, be equals? These are important questions. I will come to them as time goes on. And I don't plan to take too much of your time because I would like this to be a dialogue between us so that I may learn from you and we all get the chance to exchange opinions. How secularism is interpreted depends upon where you come from and is different in different countries. Now, given that it's a pretty big world that we live in, I'm going to confine my attention to principally where I live, which is Pakistan, and then spend just a little bit of time on what's next door in India, and then move a little bit further away, well, actually quite a bit away, and go to Europe. So let me start with Pakistan. It was founded on the assumption of Muslim nationalism, that uh, according to Mr. Jinnah, who is the founder of Pakistan, that there are only two countries, there are only two nations that live on the subcontinent. They are Hindus and Muslims and that they cannot live together in peace and therefore there needs to be a separate country and that separate country would, of course, be Pakistan. However, it was uh, not clear whether that country was to be an Islamic country or a Muslim country. There's a difference between the two because a Muslim country would be simply one where there is a majority of Muslims, whereas an Islamic country would be that which is run by Islamic law the Sharia. Now, when the question would be posed to Mr. Jinnah as to whether the country to be made would be secular or Islamic, 
he would parry the question. He did not give an answer. And in fact, he could not give an answer for one very good reason, because the Indian National Congress with Jawaharlal Nehru at, at its head was insistent that the future of India should be secular. And if Mr. Jinnah was to say that Pakistan too was to be a secular state for Muslims, <laughs> first of all, it wouldn't make any sense because by definition, a secular country is one in which uh, everybody has equal opportunities. There is equality before the law. There is no discrimination between peoples belonging to different faiths, etc. And so if one was to accept a united India, uh, that would be no different from getting Muslims to move off and form their own state. And therefore, he would parry the question. And therefore, the question of whether Pakistan would be an Islamic state or a Muslim state remained a very confused one and remains confused today. Now, most certainly, Pakistan is uh, not a secular state. And today, as 70 years ago, were you to say that Pakistan should become a secular state, you would be accused of uh, being against religion. And as um, was said by Mr. Wade, that religion, that secularism has been conflated with uh, lack of religion, with atheism, and in Pakistan specifically as being against Islam. So in Pakistan, that confusion continues. And it continues, although many of our liberal friends would like to insist that uh, Mr. Jinnah, and I keep coming back to Mr. Jinnah because he was essentially the only major leader. He was the solitary leader, in fact, the sole spokesman, as he called himself, for Muslims of India. And therefore, his every utterance has been taken with great seriously, great seriousness, including the speech that he gave on the 11th of uh, August 1947, in which he said, you can go to your temples, you can go to your mosques, you can go wherever. This has got nothing to do with the business of the state. And this has been a very celebrated speech. It is supposed to, to tell the people of Pakistan that even after it had been formed as a Muslim majority state, that it would respect the rights of, of all those who lived within it, that there would not be a concept of a majority or a minority. Now, that particular speech is uh, one of the only utterances of Mr. Jinnah. And uh, there is, um, there has been recently quite a bit of discussion on that by Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmad, who's a, who's a social scientist. He's written a very thick book on Jinnah, which I'd suggest you read if you possibly can, in which he discusses that that speech in considerable detail. However, the point is that today, Pakistan is as far as can be from a secular state. It says it derives its uh, laws from religion, but not really. Even while saying that it is not a secular state, yet it has not been able to enforce the Sharia. And so, Although the drinking of alcohol and the eating of pork is forbidden in Pakistan, yet uh, Sharia punishments have not been enforced in this country. So you do not have the cutting off of hands as is required by Sharia. You do not have uh, so many other things, including uh, the fact that today you can actually um, not only draw pictures, make photographs, but also watch television. And this is very much forbidden under Sharia. So we have some kind of a mix. 
But now let me move to our neighboring country, India, which does not have the equivalent of a Sharia. It, uh, and because Hinduism is not a religion that is so well codified as, as Islam is. Islam is very detailed, very particular. The rules of social behavior are very well prescribed. And uh, in fact, in uh, the, 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 the statement by religious scholars is that it is a mukammal zaptai hayat, a total code of life which tells you everything, what you must do, what you must not do, what you can eat, what you can drink, how you should marry, how you should sleep, the prayers you should say before climbing up the stairs and the prayers that you should say climbing down, etc., etc. And so it is supposed to be very, very complete. And on the other hand, Hinduism is very amorphous. It is, there are no prescribed rules of behavior. You have, uh, for example, Brahmins who will, uh, who will uh, be outraged by the thought of anyone consuming beef. And yet there are certain categories of Brahmins which actually do eat beef. Others stay away from onions while yet others think there's nothing wrong with them, et cetera, et cetera. So comes 1947 and India is formed under Jawaharlal Nehru. It is putatively, putatively a secular democracy. And yet it is secular in a, in a, in a rather, um, different way from European secularism in which religion was to play no role in public life. But here, there would definitely be in India, the role of religion in public life. And it would be to give each religion the, the same weightage as any other. That was the statement. And every religion would be equally valued. However, under Jawaharlal Nehru, there was not a strict adherence to that. So for example, the, Indian, the, the laws of secular India legalized intercaste marriage. Otherwise, how could you have a Kais marrying a Kshatri? or a Brahmin marrying a Shudar. That is still very difficult, but at least there is, it is allowed by law. The secular laws then sanctioned divorce, which is forbidden by, by Hindu tradition. They pro prohibited polygamy, for instance, and um, insisted upon equal inheritance for son and daughter. However, this was enforced upon the Hindu majority. It's very interesting that uh, it was not in enforced upon the Muslim majority, which were allowed to keep Muslim personal law. And so the state indifference towards religion was replaced by the state paying equal respect to all religions. Now, this had its consequences, and whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, we need to discuss that. Personally, I think that exempting Muslims from personal law did not help them. So, um, by Indian law, so far as I know, polygamy is, is permitted. Uh, under Islamic law, the the, the boy, the, the male heir gets uh, twice as much as the, as the female heir. It's a little more complicated than that, but certainly males and females are not given the same inheritance under Islamic law. And uh, I don't know, I don't think that this was a good thing for, for the Muslims of India. 
Well, let me move now to uh, where most people in, in this audience live, that is Europe. And that's actually where secularism was born. So if we move back uh, 600 years, or 550 years or whatever, to the birth of Martin Luther, well, that was a rebellion against a church that was dominating Europe that had uh, become corrupt to the extreme. And it was in response to that, that Martin Luther rebelled against it. Um, and uh, well, that, is, that was the birth of Protestantism. And then about 150 years from that time, there came to be the biggest clashes, the biggest wars that Europe has ever seen. And these, these were the religious wars of Europe. They were extremely bloody. There was, for example, an 80 years war. There was a 15 years war and there was a 30 years war. And the 30 years war was between France and Germany. And by the time it was over, the population of Germany had been reduced to one half of what it had been before the war. So from that time, there was then a movement that uh, took place. And in 1648, the Treaty of, of Westphalia was concluded. And that was the beginning of the national state a state with defined boundaries and within that boundaries, there could be secularism. Secularism came to Europe because Protestant and, and Catholic could not otherwise have lived together. So the point is that when different peoples have to live with each other and they cannot be separated off from one another, as in the case of India and Pakistan, where, well, Pakistan is mostly now 98%, 97% Muslim. In that case, okay, there is, you can have a religious state, and then the minority must take the brunt of the consequences. However, in Europe, that is not possible because Catholics and Protestants live together in proximity. If there was to be a law that would, that would apply, a different law that would apply to Catholics and a different law that would apply to Protestants, well, there'd be not only infinite confusion, but there'd be continuing strife. And so therefore the secular state was the only possibility, the only possibility for there to be peace. So this is now an, an accepted, an accepted fact in Europe, in the United States, in Australia, or wherever, that you cannot have laws that are derived from any holy text or from some unchangeable text and expect that a society be, be peaceful, be progressive, be able to accommodate its different peoples. And so secularism, I'd say is a natural consequence, an absolutely natural consequence of different peoples having to live together. And when there is no choice, but to have to live with each other. Well, this then raises a number of questions. And uh, I think the primary worry among those who believe in religion uh, and are strong believers in whatever faith they subscribe to, is that a secular society is going to be immoral for the reason that morality derives from religion. That is their belief. However, this is empirically incorrect. If we look at any any indicator, any concrete indicator of uh, morality, then 
one sees quite readily, almost immediately, that in fact, religious societies are not as moral as secular societies. So if I look at uh, my country, Pakistan, corruption, well, nobody, um, yeah, people call it bad, but it's not a cardinal sin at all. There are more murders here and more deception, fraud, intolerance than um, certainly in any European country where such things are not only frowned upon, but also punished and punished very severely. On the other hand, um, one has people who are known to be corrupt, who have even be, been convicted of corruption and yet continue to hold major public positions and continue to enjoy economic, their economic stranglehold over the rest of the country. Now, if one looks at secularism worldwide, one sees that with time, there has been a decline of religion. And so in uh, countries like uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, there is only a few percent of people who actually go to church. More than 90% don't care. This is true also of the United States, although the United States remains a, a very religious country and is going to be a religious country even after Donald Trump uh, leaves, which we hope will be soon. But, there, but the decline of religion is limited to those parts of the world which are economically prosperous. And in a sense, this makes, um, it, it, it is, uh, it, it's easy to understand. Because if one looks to how religion came into human society, the primary reason was uncertainty. Initially, it was, you didn't know what caused rain, earthquakes, physical phenomena. The forces of nature were considered beyond anything that humans could possibly understand. Disease, and today we have COVID upon us. It is uh, in, in much of Pakistan, it is uh, either ignored or considered um, something that is inflicted by God and so um, unable to be combated. However, globally, religion has declined, except in several Islamic countries, possibly most of them, and in, Indi and in India. India today is very different from what it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a second partition of India, if you will. So the, the India, which came from Jawaharlal Nehru at the time of 1947, and the India, which is now ruled by the BJP and which is increasingly on its way to making a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu majority state, These are now two different Indias and they buck the general trend. The general trend is a decrease. Let me now conclude. I don't think religion is going to go away. We'll go to Mars, we'll go beyond. Science is going to make enormous strides. We're going to be very soon at the point where we can actually from atoms and molecules create life itself. That life will be of a very simple form, but 
it will be life itself. It is going to prove the supremacy of physics. That is to say, we can understand the natural world around us, but that is still not going to get rid of God. It's not going to get rid of religion because we will not understand why we are here. What is the purpose of life? What is right and wrong? So we shall still be looking for those answers even well, into the indefinite future. However, what is not going to go away and what is going to get more and more emphasized, in my opinion, is that societies will have to become blind in terms of who their, their citizens are, who their constituents are, and give equal opportunity to all of them, irrespective of whether they happen to belong to a particular religion or if they don't belong to any religion at all. In other words, if they are atheists. One had thought that a religion like Islam, which is so particular, so definite, so prescriptive, Mukammal Zatai Hayat, remember that, total code of life, that that would be impervious to change. But uh, have you seen the new laws out of the United Arab Emirates? They're incredible, absolutely incredible. This is a country that, if you go to the website and look up, it tells you that Sharia law is the law of the UAE. And yet, cohabitation, that is to say, unmarried men and women living together, has now been sanctioned and will not be punished by law. The consumption of alcohol will not be punished by law. In the case of honor killings, punishment will be as according to any other crimes, crimes of passion, that excuse will not be used. Isn't it incredible that here you have a country that ostensibly is, uh, follows the Sharia, and yet officially that is, that is, that is uh, these new laws have been put into place. And this is as of two weeks ago. You can go and check on the web. So my final conclusion is that religions change, social behavior changes, laws will have to change with time as humans evolve in cultural and in social terms. And the only participative demo democracy that is possible is under a secular dispensation. To my mind, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the future of humankind. It is the way that ultimately all countries, all states will have to go. And the sooner they do it, the better. So I thank you for listening to me and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Roksha, uh, for a for very, uh, very, very clear, uh, showing us very clear picture on secularism, uh, starting from Pakistan to India and to the Europe. And uh, then giving your uh, views up, upon uh, uh, what would be the future of uh, uh, our world looks like. So uh, from here, uh, uh, can I ask uh, all all of our participants to please uh, not to unmute yourself, but uh, I'm uh, putting the gallery view here so that uh, I could see everybody. Uh, just raise your hands and then I would uh, uh, take questions one by one and uh, thank you very much for your patience and please uh, again I would suggest you all not to 
unmute yourself until I ask you. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of hands I have seen here and uh, I'm, uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mansoor Alam first to ask his question, please. Okay, can you hear me? Thank you very much for the yes. giving me a chance. Uh, I have a question with Hudbai that uh, that has secularism in Europe changed the behavior of its people and contributed to evolution of European unity. And other question is immigrants in European secular society get every kind of opportunity, but in their own country, they don't support secularism. How this contradiction can happen? Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Sir. Okay, that's a marvelous question that uh, when we people um, go to Europe, go to the United States or Australia, we insist that we be treated just as the citizens of that country, the white ones of that country. However, when it comes to Pakistan, we uh, lose that enthusiasm. And it's something that we have to remind ourselves again and again that if we insist upon treating the minorities of Pakistan in the way that we do, then we do not really have a right to make this kind of a demand upon European countries. Why we do it? Because we can get away with it. Because when you go to Europe, there is an established framework to which you can appeal to. In Pakistan, constitutionally, the minorities do not have the same rights as Muslims do. And this was written, this was written into the constitution very early on, starting with the Objectives Revolu Resolution 1948. And thereafter, it became codified into uh, successive constitutions. And now um, there is, um, it, to insist upon equality will require overcoming this hurdle. It is something that I think should be done. It is something that over time, hopefully can be done but it will require getting people to acknowledge that all peoples are the same, that difference of, differences of faith should not be reflected in the law. Mansoor Alam, have your, uh, has your question is addressed? Okay, fine. Thank uh, you very much, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, okay. Again, uh, I'm uh, uh, now. Please raise hands. And yeah, uh, Muhammad Haris uh, actually, and uh, later I would. Yes, Muhammad Haris, please. Please unmute yourself and then ask questions. Okay. Uh, and then can you hear questions. me? Yes. Uh, so I have a question from Doctor Sir, uh, like. Uh, uh, recent demise of Khadim Rizvi and gatherings on his funeral. Uh, uh, what would you expect or predict the future of Pakistan on Pakistan society? Oh, you. are you referring to the 150,000 people who were present at the yeah. funeral? Well, it shows that um, there is a big uh, following for that kind of thinking. But uh, let's also remember that this by itself could not have come about, that this had the backing of the, of the authorities in Pakistan. The TLP, whose head was Khadim Hussain Rizvi, was uh, nobody. He was an unheard of quantity until the point that he became politically useful for displacing the Nawaz Sharif government. At that time, the Pakistani military establishment picked him up 
and decided that he would be the person who could launch a mass protest against Nawaz Sharif. Now, they have kept him in reserve since that time. And I think there's uh, very little dispute that his followers had been handsomely rewarded for having blockaded Islamabad for several days. Everyone, uh, well, all Pakistanis in this audience will probably have seen that video in which a in which the head of the Rangers, the director general of the Rangers was seen handing out cash, 1,000 rupee notes to those who had blockaded Islamabad. So the fact that the TLP has become so prominent and that it's the demise of its leader was mourned by Imran Khan, by the president of Pakistan and the and the chief of Pakistan's army, all these go to show that the use of religion by the state is certainly very much there and that unless we actively protest against it, it's going to remain there. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ishiak Saab, please. Dr. Ishtiaq Saab, can you please uh, unmute yourself and then ask question? Now it's done. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Dr. Pervez Hoodboy for an excellent presentation. I think this was one of the finest summaries of the overall argument about uh, secularism and why I think morally it is the best uh, solution human societies have found to preserve both freedom and equality. So this was done so well that I'm uh, thoroughly pleased. I just wanted to clarify one point uh, because that is very much in the Indian discussions now. And... Uh, uh, since we both agree that Jawaharlal Nehru is the architect of secular India, how do we explain that there was an exception allowed for the Muslims uh, to practice their personal law? And the reason is that uh, in 1931, there is a declaration of fundamental rights at Karachi. You know, this followed after uh, the hanging of uh, Bhagat Singh and Congress had to come up with something radical and it was uh, equal rights, you know, all civil and political rights that we can think of and social and economic rights included. But those were protested by not only uh, conservative Muslims, but also Hindu Mahasabha and the rest of the conservative sections of India. And for the Muslims, it was now very difficult not to support the Muslim League and go with Congress. Therefore, I think the Congress agreed on the request of the Jamiyat Ulama Hind that uh, Muslim personal law will not be touched so that their constituency of Muslims could be uh, pleased that in India, their personal law, since prevails so very well explained that it is such a totalistic view of life and the Sharia and personal law are considered the holiest part of that. So this was done, but Nehru is on record saying that, uh, that he hoped that in due course, the Muslim community would like, would like to join the main, mainstream. What happened subsequently, we all know. I mean, instead of joining the mainstream, most of the educated Muslims had shifted to Pakistan, uh, what was left in India were either the old feudal lords who waited until they sold their properties or the ulema who took over. And therefore, instead of the Muslims joining the mainstream, this sort of uh, insulation, isolationism took place. Then we have the Congress making a major blunder and that is out of the concern for the vote bank when the Shah Bano case 
came up and the Supreme Court gave a ruling in favor of this woman, divorced woman getting the same support as any other Indian national. But then Rajiv Gandhi, and then they passed a law exempting the Muslims. So this is a very unfortunate thing. And I am in favor of at least one thing that the BJP wants, and that is a uniform civil code. That is the same laws for all Indian citizens. And that's all. Otherwise, uh, I think the discussion has been now open for many others to take part in it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. thank you, Dr. Ishtar. Uh, you are a historian and you have added depth to this discussion, taking up particularly this point. I'll just add one point to it. Yeah. Alama Iqbal, in his uh, later incarnation, so he was a very uh, open minded person prior to going to the West, but, but after he came back. Yes. He appealed to Muslims and he appealed to the British in particular saying that religion and religious laws need to be protected, both of Muslims and of Hindus. And so he was very much against Hindu reformers. So those who belong to the, uh, um, to the, to the Indian reformers like uh, Brahmo Samaj and its later incarnations, he thought that uh, those were very dangerous. So I, I, I think uh, since he is such a major influence on Pakistani politics, I just needed to add in this. Little. Let me add here, let me add, since you have opened this discussion, uh, Iqbal having this position, you know, in this book on Jinnah, take it up in detail, how he comes out so strongly against any idea of territorial nationalism as anathema, that for a Muslim to accept territorial nationalism is to abjure Islam. This, he goes so far. And so Iqbal can be quoted the way you want. I'm sorry to say like the Quranic verses can be quoted for whatever purpose people have in mind, good, bad, and so on. Iqbal is always there ready with all these ideas. And this is very frightening because in the discussion with Mulana Hussain Ahmed Madni, who took up Vatniyat, shared territory, share homeland as the basis for joining with Hindus and others in the liberation of India. Uh, Iqbal condemned him as a poor scholar of Islam who didn't know Arabic and so on and so forth. So what you say is reinforced by other formulations of Iqbal, including uh, one statement to the Punjab governor that you give too much importance to the Ahmadis and they are a subversive threat to the Muslim community. And Khadim Hussain was a man of many colors. That's right. Khadim Hussain Rizvi went to his uh, mausoleum the last time he was protesting, just to emphasize the, the sectarian nature of Iqbal's thinking. So, I mean, you're very right. Iqbal must be, and in my book, I go at great length to, to demonstrate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ishaq. Uh, Ishaq Sahib, uh, Rais Saram Sahib. Rais Saram, can, can you open your mic, please? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would not like to dare when two honorable personalities are going to discuss something. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think I will thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Hudbai. Uh, it was very in informative and uh, clearing uh, in short form, but very uh, informative and enlightening. Uh, I will come to my question on before uh, I tell it, uh, you have uh, shortly, um, mentioned that uh, uh, in Pakistan or somewhere else, uh, the religion is not going to be changed. It's, uh, it's uh, all right, because uh, it's like uh, Zami Jumbat and Jumbat <coughs> Muhammad, uh, the religion, uh, we are not going to change the re religion too. Our problem is just to find out the way, my personally, 
and I think uh, for others to uh, to find out the way how we can uh, approach the people of India or Pakistan or other countries uh, to convince them about the secularism, then uh, I have some time ago heard from uh, honorable uh, anthropologist uh, Talal Asad Saab. He mentioned he lived in the uh, Middle East. He was born in uh, Saudi Arabia, lived uh, also in India and Pakistan too. He knew very well the society in the Middle East and he has pointed out that, that uh, it's uh, actually it's a problem of traditions and customs. The people have always, uh, uh, they, they think that if uh, secularism uh, comes that they, uh, they will lose uh, their traditional uh, traditional powers, uh, their customs, and like that. That's why uh, that um, uh, we should always take care that there is a relation of ambiguity and distinction. That's the, both are uh, uh, necessary, but in its form as it is. Uh, I will request you to please, if you can, uh, say something more about it. But uh, actually, the role plays customs and traditions uh, <clears throat> when we are going to approach the people. Thank you. Well, Raisa, you know that customs change with time. You've seen over your lifetime how we were with uh, our parents as compared to how children are with uh, their parents today. You see how celebrations were done earlier, how celebrations are done today. Customs change. But more than that, even very fundamental things like interpretations of religion change. Religion is not fixed. Let me give you an example. If you lived a thousand years ago, having slaves would not be a problem for you. If you were born in uh, any part of Arabia, in Algeria, in North Africa, in India. Having slaves would be no problem. In fact, even until uh, just uh, the beginning of the 20th century, in fact, it was, I think, 1920 or so. This is after the fall of the, the, caliph the Turkish Caliphate that, sir, that, uh, that slavery was outlawed, 1933. Yes, 1933 is when slavery was outlawed. So today you cannot keep a slave, although it is sanctioned by the Quran. The Quran certainly says that you can have slaves. It says you, sh if you, if you're kind, you should let them go. But you can have slaves, and yet today no one has slaves except for Daesh. Or take um, the example that I gave you earlier that there will be no pictures, no visual representations of humans. And yet you and I watch television. And in fact, we are watching each other where we are seeing each other's faces. And yet those of us who are believers in Islam see no harm in this. Now it is technology which has pushed the limits and which has changed what we consider to be right or wrong in other words, religion itself is changing. Now, why is this happening? Okay, on the one hand, there's technology. On the other hand, there is that different peoples have to communicate with each other. And so even in this group that I see over here before me, I can see uh, six or seven faces only. But uh, I can see that there are people from the other side of the border, from India. And uh, aren't we able to talk to each other? How can we talk to each other unless we value each other as human beings? And so the belief that humanity, a shared humanity must transcend acquired beliefs, that is, that guarantees, that guarantees the victory of secularism. I just may add one sentence. Uh, I think also those those uh, some of the traditions 
are kept alive by the economic systems, also by feudalism or capitalism or neoliberalism, because it suits them very well that people are entangled in those traditions. Absolutely, I would agree. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Any, any other? Uh, uh, can I see the hands who want <laughs> to ask question? Yes, Amir Murgai sahab. Yeah. Can yeah. you unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you, uh, Professor Udbai Sab, Dr. Sab. Uh, nice to see you here. And uh, I mean, uh, we met like 20 years ago when you were here on for the the entry um, nuclear program films you had made in early 2000s, I think. You were in The Hague. And um, we, uh, we met uh, at that time. But anyhow, a nice th thanks for this presentation. But I have some comments, certain questions, and I hope that uh, I will be able to put all those uh, before here. Uh, the first is that, uh, uh, in a way, your uh, presentation is uh, your talk is quite into what we call as the secular, uh, secular, uh, secular thesis within the social sciences. Means that um, uh, with the with the emergence of modern societies, with the emergence of with modernization, modernization, with the urbanizations, the um, societies will uh, be uh, the role of the religion will diminish. And uh, uh, we will get more uh, kind of uh, secular ideas into societies. Um, but it's not that, uh, you know, uh, even within uh, considering your own examples, that this, this thesis is actually uh, is failed in a sense that uh, in the last 40, 50 years, um, we see that religion is not vanishing, but it is, it is, it is rising. I mean, you gave the example of India. I mean, uh, within the Muslim societies, you have though already that, mm -hmm. and also, for example, the, the, the whole the move moon movements in in Korea, for example, you know, the huge marriages on the religious basis, and then in Africa and and Latin America, the Pentecostal movements, which are emerging in the last. 20, 30 years, which shows, you know, uh, even the political leaders, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, who can't consider themselves away from those. I mean, uh, the present Brazilian, for example, the Brazilian leader, he can't consider himself outside of that uh, Pentecostal movements, which are in, in Brazil. In that sense, uh, I would not say that religion is vanishing, but religion is actually uh, uprising in the last 30, 40 years. And coming back to Europe, for example, I mean, I, I would not say that, uh, I mean, if I, if I consider your talk, I mean, it seems that, you know, uh, in a way after the French Revolution or something, uh, certain political elite emerged who uh, kind of organized the societies following uh, principles of the, at least the ideas of the French Revolution of uh, rights of the man, for example. And, uh, but uh, that those developments were quite gradual developments. I mean, I was, you know, I was amazed when I came into the, into the Netherlands in the, in the 90s, and I found during my studies that there was a political party called ARP, ARP, meant anti-revolutionary party. And uh, I, uh, amazing was that, that I thought that ARP was against the, you know, the uh, Soviet Union or, or the, uh, the Soviet revolution, but they were actually against the French revolution. The ARP, the anti-revolutionary party against the French revolution. I mean, they were existed till the early eighties. And, uh, and then they, you know, uh, emerged into the, what we call as the social Democrats in, uh, in, in Holland or in, in even in, the, in the Germany. So which can, we, uh, what I want to say is that the, the, uh, the emergence or, uh, uh, or uh, penetration of secular ideas or the vanishing of, or, or is quite gradually which has happened in, in these societies. And it is not totally gone away. Religion has not gone away in the, in the society. I mean, from top to bottom, I mean, if you look, if we see the, for example, the, uh, the kings and queens, when they take oath, they still take oath on the, on the, on the name of God. 
or even certain, certain countries, for example, UK, I mean, still the Protestant church is the main national church there. And uh, similarly, uh, only one country would I say, which is totally, uh, you know, secular uh, rule, say, is, is the France in itself. But the kind of turns which is, is in the last uh, couple of uh, decades, the French is, the secularism is taking, it is, it is kind of, in itself, it's problematic. It is getting more fundamentalist kind of secularism, which we are getting uh, there. But anyhow, uh, uh, those are certain points uh, uh, which I uh, uh, which I want to uh, say. I mean, in that sense, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, but my main point is that we can we can see that uh, uh, secularism on on the one hand is 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 not. Uh, the, the, the turn towards uh, the secularism, which was in the six, 60s and 70s, and the idea emerged that we are, we are going to... Uh, so, sorry, I have to, first I want to finish this, that uh, in the 60s and 70s, the kind of uh, gradually every society is getting secular. I mean, that is how I halted to the emerging uprising of the more religion. And the second is that we should also think about the, how the secularism works in different European societies. I mean, it is, uh, they are secular differently, but the religion at, at, at the street level and at, at the gradual societal level is, is working still there. That's my point. Yes, Thank you uh, for that very perceptive comment. And I do agree with you that uh, religion continues to play a role. When I said that uh, religion is diminishing overall, I meant that if you take the global average, and in fact, an attempt in this direction is has recently be, been done. I'm not sure whether it's a Pew survey or it is some other survey. I would have to look that up. But they have identified countries which, uh, in which religion is playing a diminishing part and identified those countries where it is increasing its role and the number of believers is increasing. So apart from India and Muslim countries, everywhere it, it has been found that religion has a diminishing influence. You can see that the Roman Catholic Church is now struggling for survival. It is making such compromises that would be beyond belief to the point that, uh, well, tomorrow gay marriages will be deemed uh, okay by, by, the, by the Pope. It's very possible. Now, uh, I did say that religion is never going to go away. That's because of the fundamental questions that science can, cannot ever answer. However, the role that it is going to play in constructing social norms and in, in uh, more importantly, in making laws is already on its way out. And even Pakistan are finding it very difficult, if not impossible, to make laws that are consistent with the Quran. Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, so, uh, I would uh, before I would uh, uh, invite another uh, uh, participant to ask question. J just a clarification that this is a dialogue because someone has uh, a chat, you know, uh, sent a message to me that uh, why people are giving their opinion. This is a dialogue, so you can give your opinion, but shortly, and uh, obviously there is no harm. Uh, even if you go against uh, the opinion of uh, any uh, person uh, here or even uh, against the opinion of Dr. Udbai as well, and you can ask questions as well. So um, I'm uh, going to uh, ask uh, Tasadduk Sahab here. Uh, you can ask question, please, sir. Thank you so much. I was not uh, absolutely sure that uh, you could see my hand, so thank you. Anyway, so it, it, it's going to be a very quick question. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, just give you a, a very recent information. There was a poll by Le Figaro in France uh, in which it, uh, the conclusion was 
that the 75% of the Muslims under the age of 25 believe in the superiority of the Sharia law against the state law. Now, this is something uh, absolutely uh, in incredible uh, because you have to know that people under the age of 25, I mean, these are people who, are, who belong to the second or third generation or something like that. And uh, so my question was that knowing this thing, what is happening today in Europe, at least I'm giving you an example here in France, uh, do you think, uh, uh, the question is to Mr. Uh, Hoodboy, uh, do you think that at some stage in the foreseeable future, uh, there will be a majority of Muslims who will be ready to accept uh, some kind of reformation in Islam, as it happened in Christianity? What you are referring to is the consequence of ghettoization, and ghettoization has been occurring in different European countries, Australia, the United States, less in the United States, and therefore you will find far more young people, Muslims, who are uh, willing to give superiority to the law of the land in the US. So the particularities of Muslims settling into Europe have somehow uh, caused this phenomena where the law of the land is uh, considered to be of uh, lesser validity than that of the Sharia. Now, this is a very dangerous situation, obviously, because this is going to lead to an enormous backlash. It has already unleashed some, but it could get much worse. It could lead to not just a closing of the borders, but um, active discrimination. And so it would, it could, unless it is checked, lead to a catastrophic decline of the quality of life and the quality of justice that is available to countries in the West. And it could happen, but let's hope it will not happen yeah. and actually work to make this more difficult to happen. And that can be done by, look, Muslims are born just as reasonable as any other. And if they are exposed to a wider set of uh, contacts in the society in which they live, in, in other words, if we can work towards avoiding ghettoization, then I think that this problem over time will be lessened. Well, I, I, I'm not very sure that um... I understand you fully because um, we have been watching what has been happening in UK, for example. In UK, the Muslims, and uh, particularly the Pakistanis, have been there for, for a very long time. And uh, what we see there is that even today, there are so many young girls uh, at the universities uh, who, when they graduate, refuse to shake hands with the vice chancellor. And there are so many examples when they, they, they want their ghettoization and separatism uh, all the time. Oh, sorry, I, I, can you hear me? Or, or, yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. So this thing has been happening. And of course, as you know, the, the, the situation at Cross, I, I, I completely agree with you on the fact that uh, the state has failed uh, in many respects, to integrate uh, this uh, uh, the, this Muslim population for quite some time, but beyond that, uh, the, there is a very big fault of the Muslim community itself because there are enormous number of cases where they don't want to get integrated at all, and that is a, that is a real concern. I mean, explaining that people are saying that the, uh, the poll coming out with the conclusion that people under the age of 25, 75% of them consider that the Sharia law is superior to that of the state law 
is not something which goes with the values of any of the states in Europe. I'm not very well acquainted with uh, how it is in France, but what I have, uh, what I, the little bit that I know about Britain is that um, it is the poorer people among uh, Muslims and among Pakistanis in particular who uh, adhere to these kinds of traditional beliefs who will, whose girls will not shake hands with, uh, with uh, boys, with men and so forth. They graduate Certainly from- that does happen. But if you look at those who have made it to the middle class and above, there you will find that there is no such thing. So this is not something that is intrinsic to Muslims. It is very much class dependent. And the more fair and the more equitable in terms of wealth distribution that Western countries become, and the more opportunities that are given to Muslims, the lesser will be this problem. It will not necessarily go away, but it will become much much less accentuated than it is present. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, uh, Lilith? Uh, do you want to ask a question, please? Lilith? Yes? Unmute you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, a very good, uh, really good presentation, uh, Dr. Hoodby. And thank you for orga- organizing this. Uh, so I have a very similar question. So India and Pakistan is sitting here together, <laughs> actually. <laughs> if you could see that. I mean, unity can definitely be achieved. If not in the subcontinent, then perhaps abroad. So that's al- <laughs> always the case. Uh, however, we both had a question. Um, perhaps you could shed some light to it. Um, in countries uh, where Muslims are in minorities, be it India, be it parts of Africa, or even uh, Europe, as a matter of fact, um, it's always visible that uh, majority of those Muslims people living abroad, they prefer uh, ghettoization, like you know, to live in their own community rather than actually intermingling with the majority. So is it a religion who, which has to play a role in actually this ghettoization or is it like, where does the root cause lie? If you could maybe shed some light to it. Thank you. I don't think it's uh, necessarily religion. It's, uh, you see, um, one can have multiple identities. One can belong to different communities. And so if, your community is your professional community and uh, and a community in some other way. Yeah. So for example, I don't see any problem with um, a Muslim gay and a Hindu gay living together. They, they, they don't uh, worry about these things. So the, it depends upon which is your primary affiliation, your association with which group. Mm-hmm. In as Muslims become more educated, more able to compete in the open playing field, they will naturally move away from ghettoization. You've seen this happen in Britain, and you see that the mayor of London, mm-hmm. he's a Muslim, and you see even conservative party, those at the very top are Muslims. And so uh, in time, this can happen, but then You have to rise up, educate yourself, get in tune with how it is going with the kinds of people you associate with, your job, etc. It's it's been a little more difficult for Muslims, but I don't think it is insuperable. You saw that uh, Turkey, which was the which was where the caliphate was based, could modernize itself. It did so. And so did Iran until the 1979 revolution. It had become very modern, very, in fact, uh, it was totally uh, unrecognizable from what it is today. Mm -hmm. And if it could have happened in the past, why can it not happen in the future? Hmm. Let's hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I may add, just, just add, yeah, two please. Sentences, just literally two sentences. I think one is one. This is rooted in history slightly as well, because when the guest workers uh, were brought into Europe, they were all put into so-called ghettos, and not for, for the sake of putting them into ghettos, but because 
They thought here is a group of foreigners, and if they live together within their own culture, with their own community, they will be more comfortable and um, they can move more freely. That was one reason. And second sentence I would like to add is that just, I think two or three weeks ago, the, the Guardian newspaper did a research in Europe and uh, you can find it on internet. And one of the discoveries which surprised me a little bit as well as uh, me as well, that the biggest obstacle to, to integration was religion. I always thought it might have been the race or language or something else, but they found out according to their research it was religion. That's yes, uh, Shiraz, uh, can you please ask question if you want to? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I uh, just uh, about this academic. Uh, Mr. Hudbhai talked about the research, uh, this, uh, education. So uh, you have been a great uh, uh, admirer and advocate of the scientific thinking in Pakistan your entire, uh, in fact, academic career, starting from uh, a colleague and a pupil of uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, uh, Abdul Salam. And we have uh, seen recently what, uh, what has been done to you, forcefully uh, removing you from the uh, educational institutes and practically uh, a very well-organized efforts have been done to, to silence you, your relentless advocacy for the scientific thinking and the reason in education system, in policy making, and as, as a light house for creating a new generation. So now, not only you, many other people have also been. So it, it, is, uh, it seems that a very systematic uh, policy has been being being pursued. In this case, after like uh, uh, struggling for more than three or four decades, what, what are your feelings? I know you, you, you cannot be disappointed and you will always remain pragmatic, but do you see hope that Pakistan is anyway on the path of uh, making a scientific query, critical thinking, as a light of their, their education system and nation building. Are you hopeful for that? Or you see the society and the state going down the drain? Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, I appreciate um, what you said, but there are a lot of people who are struggling. Some are hopeful, some are not. And as for myself, I don't care. I don't care whether I, does it matter if I'm hopeful or otherwise? Things will be as they will be. What can do, what can one do except one's best? And so you simply have to keep plugging away. The fact is that this is a country. Pakistan is a country that's not going to go away. Not after I die and not even after 10 generations later, is going to remain on the face of the earth. And the only question is, can we make things a little bit better? Or sh should we just be silent spectators? Otherwise, the question of hope or not hope, to me, is not an important one. Yes, of course, I do feel pain when uh, nasty things happen. But um, so what? And I think that there are plenty of people who are fighting, struggling everywhere in the world for doing what little bit they can. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, Mr. Vinod? Uh, let me try to... Uh get myself on the on the screen thank you very much and good to see you Pervez. Uh, looking well lovely to see you Vinod. Uh, thank you thank you i just wanted what you just said in your last uh, <clears throat> comment that we will keep plugging away regardless uh, the countries will be there and we will keep plugging away so one 
small share of fez comes to mind aur likhe ke wo shaakh ke qafile nahi ha talkhiye ayam abhi aur badhegi ha ehle sitam mashki sitam karte rahenge manzoor ye talkhi ye sitam humko gawara dam hai to mudawa e alam karte rahenge i think what we you uh, all of us who believe in uh, a secular future and hopefully for humanity as a whole and uh, for our countries in particular that is our task ke ha manzoor hai ke ye situation hai but dam hai to mudawa e alam karte rahenge thank you very much thank you very much thank you yes uh, zaidi sahab <clears throat> sabdar zaidi first of all uh, thank you very much ud bhai you join uh, us this we were looking forward to meet you i have a small question referring uh, mr jina letter to egyptian uh, scholar hasan ul bana in his letter he asked his help uh, making pakistan really a true islamic state and of course we all know his personal life style was completely western so it is kind of mystery for me uh, can you reveal the forces which were using mr jina uh, to employing their policies on this newly built state uh, sometime i think about a urdu proverb uh, looking forward pakistan as a secular state is it seems like diwane ka khwab so what would you say about it thank you very much i am not aware of that letter but perhaps uh, dr ishtiaq could comment upon it yeah however what i do know is that prior to the elections of 1937 when the muslim league lost very badly and it lost even in muslim majority uh, parts of india it realized and mr jinnah realized that the only way to make the muslim league prominent is by playing the communal card and so he very openly said in 1937 or 1938 i can't remember at the muslim gaya conference he said what's wrong with having religion and politics he most explicitly said that there is nothing wrong with it islam is the complete code of life islam is what tells us is tells us how to behave etc etc uh, we are not against anyone but we are for islam and our politics is now wedded to islam so he said that very explicitly then but in terms of what he meant by the islamic state is very unclear because sometimes he would say that we are fighting for a muslim state a state where the majority will be muslims and sometimes he would say islamic state and i don't think he he studied islam because he was unable to quote any verse of the quran either in arabic or in urdu or even in english i don't know if he if he had ever uh, studied islam in any proper sense true he was born a muslim but um, as you said uh, the way he lived the what he ate what he drank and uh, look a lot of muslims drink uh, alcohol uh, secretly hmm. but he even ate pork so when he talked about an islamic state you don't really know we don't really know what he meant uh, maybe he thought that um, people will not look at his lifestyle i think the only thing he was concerned about was how to get muslims together on a large enough platform maximize the electoral strength of the muslim league and uh, then work towards the separation of india in which he certainly succeeded but in terms of that letter uh, i don't know maybe um, is uh, dr ishtiaq still there if he is perhaps he could comment yeah if i may 
Uh, yes, there is this letter and I've quoted it in my book. Uh, it was a time when within the Arab world, the understanding was that Pakistan is comparable to Israel created by the British. And therefore the sympathies in the Arab world were often with the Indian National Congress. I, I even mentioned that in my book. So uh, the radical sort of Muslims, you know, at that time, anti-imperialist and so on, were leaning towards the Congress type of freedom struggle. So then uh, Kaidi Azam wrote this letter, it's on record 1948, and I've quoted the whole letter where he says that we need your guidance to make Pakistan an ideal state. Similarly, the only law Jinnah introduced uh, was to establish the reconstruction of Islam uh, uh, you know, group in Lahore to be headed by Alama Muhammad Asad. Muhammad Asad, as you know, was an Austrian Jew who was running away from anti-Semitism. He became a Muslim and a great scholar of Islam. So he headed that department. There is absolutely no doubt that Jinnah did not, he never wanted Pakistan to be a secular state. He wanted to, it to be an ideal Muslim state, which he could never really explain what it was. And in my book, I show the problems with such a, a position that it took. So if that is the question, yes, there is a letter. May I suggest that the problem with Muslims is that they say that there is no theocracy in Islam. And I've shown in my book that this is true. There is no priestly class to preside over what is the Islamic law. But I've said the word for it is nomocracy, which is the supremacy of the law. The Sharia is supreme, not the priest. The priest is there only to interpret. So when they say we don't have a, a theocracy, they are right. But it doesn't mean they mean a secular state. And I think Jinnah wanted some sort of a democratic Pakistan, which we all know. And in my book, I demonstrate he never explained in a coherent and consistent manner. So, I mean, there is no way of explaining this further. Thank you. Uh, Ijaz Zulfikar, please, uh, can you unmute yourself and then ask question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Abhis Saab, and thank you, Dr. Saab, uh, for raising the issue of uh, uh, importance of equality. And uh, 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 Dr. Saab, uh, looking at the uh, concerns of Pakistani Christians and religious minorities, especially the uh, abduction and post-conversion of underage girls, and uh, connecting it to the Arzu Raja case and Farah Shaheen case, uh, I will I will ask uh, you two scholars, uh, Doc Sab as well, why Pakistan is failing to give a federal law which can protect the underage girls of religious minorities from being abducted, from being raped, from being post the forcefully converted cert. In Arzu Raja case, we also see that even the uh, point was established that the girl is underage and the, the, the marriage was uh, uh, nullified. Still, the court failed to give a clear uh, order to the police to arrest uh, the, the abductor of Arzu Raja under the charges of raping a 13-year-old girl, sir. Sir, where is our freedom and where is our equality? Thank you, sir. These are very painful examples that you have quoted over here. And I could quote an even more painful one. Well, it's hard to say which is more painful one of a woman who had to take refuge in this very house where I'm speaking from. And she was a married woman and abducted, forced to change her religion to Islam, from Christian to Islam. And a helpless husband watched on and a helpless three children watched on. 
So there are many such examples to quote from, but I think what really hurt me in my heart the most was that when I was, until recently, teaching at Foreman Christian College in Lahore, they just sacked me, but uh, <laughs> that's another matter. When I was teaching there and I looked at my class roster and I could not make out who among my students were Muslim and who were Christian, it's because the Christians would change their names so as not to be persecuted. And I remember this being so very different in the early days of Pakistan. In the 1950s, our neighbors were Christians, Parsis, and even a few Hindus. And we all could perfectly well get, get along as good neighbors with each other. They would send Christmas presents, a Christmas We'd, they'd send something, a Christmas cake to us. We'd send them biryani on Eid, etc., etc. All that has changed. It's majoritarianism at its worst, and majorities everywhere can become oppressive. They have become extremely oppressive in Pakistan, and they are becoming oppressive in India. So this must be fought against. It must be fought against by whatever means we have legally. And we must use them. We must use those legal means. We must uh, keep raising our voices. And uh, things will eventually change. Thank you very much, uh, uh, I, I seek your short comment on uh, whether Pakistan needs a federal law to stop this. Well, it uh, forced conversions. Certainly, we need a law which says that uh, unless a girl who is uh, above a certain age, 18, and we're, there have to be a lot of changes in the law. She has to be able to demonstrate that it has been off, done off her free will. If she has converted, that she has done it off her free will. We should certainly not try and stop all conversions. Uh, it's uh, people's right. It's an adult's right to choose, but the law has to be such that conversions made under duress are not possible, are rendered impossible. Thank, uh, Mr. Tom, I think uh, the username is Tom. Uh, do you want to ask a question? Okay, Ms. Tom, okay, there's no, uh, uh, because, May I? Yes. Is that yeah, okay. yeah, uh, who is this? Uh, it's Adil Sima. Yeah, Adil. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was really nice to hear Dr. Pervez Hudbai and Dr. Ishtiak. Uh, Dr. Hudbai, uh, I have been watching you since my childhood, and it was due to your inspiration. That it makes me started, feel old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am makes still in my 40s. It makes me feel ancient. <laughs> yes, sir. I am in my early 40s, 41. <laughs> so it was uh, due to your inspiration that we started a movement in KP, uh, Professors Association for Student Services. And you were part of uh, one of its uh, online seminar uh, a few months back, I think, if you remember. And we are trying to inculcate critical thinking and we have uh, tried to create a parallel space to our traditional education system. Uh, where we interact with students and uh, faculties, academic community, and we uh, try to have different seminars and conferences, symposium, etc. Uh, so you are, uh, the candle you have lit, it is uh, still there and there are many carriers of that candle. Some of them you might know and there are few whom you don't know actually. I have uh, I have a question and I want uh, Dr. Ishtiak and Pervez Udbai both to respond to this question. 
my question is about uh, jinnah's struggle for pakistan do you think jinnah was actually uh, thinking for a separate homeland for muslims uh, he was using uh, that religious card that communal card just to pressurize congress and to get uh, Uh, Indian Federation, in which his demands are the demands of the Muslim leagues, could be uh, realized. And later on, uh, when Pakistan came into being on 1947, and that partition actually occurred, was Jinnah you know, ready for that? Uh, secondly, after partition, the way Jinnah was painted, a uh, clergyman, a uh, mullah, actually, it was painted in our textbooks. so some of the statements of mr jana they were taken up by the uh, post colonial elites or the colonial elites the military civil bureaucracy and they used the same religious card to suppress uh, the resistance movements in pakistan the movements of left in pakistan or the people struggling for a more egalitarian society so what are your comments on this Well, I will let uh, uh, Dr. Ishtiaq uh, speak well, after me. Uh, but uh, very much, let me just... say very briefly that uh, Mr. Jinnah was very strongly anti-communist, anti-socialist. He made numerous speeches to this effect. He spoke to students at Adigarh Muslim University, warning them to stay away from communists. He earlier on had uh, run. he wanted to be uh, he wanted to run on a ticket for the tories in britain the conservative party but he couldn't get it and uh, so he tried for the labor but couldn't get that either mr jina did want pakistan i know that there are s- some historians aisha jalal in particular who says that uh, Pakistan was thrust onto Jinnah that Jinnah would have settled for some equitable uh, something that would have brought justice to the muslims of uh, of india and that um, this is demonstrated by his acceptance of the cabinet mission plan i am not prepared to quite believe that because if you look at mr jinnah's statements from 1937 onwards until 1947 so that's a full 10 years it was emphasizing that hindus and muslims are different from each other his speech of 1940 the two nation theory emphasized that it said that in his speech mr jinnah said that we belong to two completely separate strands of humanity we don't have common heroes the hero of one is the villain of the other etc etc we don't eat the same foods we don't do this we don't do that and so it strikes me as being quite uh, illogical that uh, someone should say that he didn't want pakistan well he was he was a master negotiator and he got what he wanted but uh, to say he didn't want pakistan i think is is not right as for did he have a plan for pakistan i don't think so i don't think that there was a vision if there were if there had been a vision he showed he would have written it down Now, i know that everyone talks about the qaid's vision but i'm still looking for what it is in terms of economics the sources of its economic strength where it would how it would employ its people uh, how it would organize its uh, foreign policy how it would uh, set up industries etc what would be the role of education how much would be spent on education and so forth so i don't believe that there was a plan for pakistan and indeed he never wrote anything about that he did give a lot of speeches but speeches are not the same as a as a party manifesto or even a draft constitution 
do I have a opportunity to say a few words, Amir? Amir yes, Amir. please, sir. Yes, yeah. please, sir. Since I have been invited to comment, I would say like this that since Parvez has mentioned Aisha Jalal, I was not sure if I should, but now that the name is out, uh, people who when they read my book will, I think this will be settled. What she does is that uh, from 1940, you see, I said 22nd March is the foundational speech which Jinnah made one day before the Lahore resolution was moved, which later on became the Pakistan resolution. From that time onwards, till he accepted the cabinet mission plan and under what circumstances he did, I explain at length. I would not like to take so much time because today Parvez is the one who is our main speaker. And But I will briefly say like this, what she does is all the speeches, statements and messages where Jinnah over and over ad infinitum, it means without counting, says that he wants a separate state for Muslims and a separate state means a, the partition of India. He says it all the time. And then on several occasions, and I quote them, he says, it is the Congress propaganda that we are using for the Pakistan demand for bargaining. No, we actually mean Pakistan. So Aisha Jalal has gotten away with what I think is in academia. If plagiarism is the worst crime, it is something comparable that you simply ignore the main actor that you are studying. The sole spokesman is Jinnah. None of those speeches is there. And I show how, if you look at the speeches of Jinnah in her bibliography, you also see that period is missing. So I would only like to uh, clarify that that mystery is over. My book has now been reviewed several times and I'm sure Aisha Jalal knows that I have brought this out in the public. Since today, <laughs> this thing was taken up again, it is simply not true that he didn't want uh, Pakistan and he didn't want uh, the partition of India. I have argued that the only thing he wanted was to have India partitioned and he used all those arguments that a lawyer would have in his brief to win the case. Its consequences are with all of us. I quote, for example, you know, we have our historian, Dr. Yaqub Bangash, and uh, who shared with me, and this is quoted in the book, that he met Sabzada Yaqub Ali Khan, Pakistan's ex-foreign minister, who told him, that when Sabzada Saab was a young man, he and Admiral Ehsan, both he was from the Navy, Sabzada Saab from the Army, they were aides of the uh, Governor General. They went to Mr. Jinnah at about eight in the evening and said, sir, what is happening on the constitution? The Indian constitution is making progress every day and we keep on hearing all the uh, uh, reforms they are going to make. And Jinnah then confided, he said, look, boys, uh, I have made different promises to different people and it will take time before they are sorted out. And I leave the making of the Pakistan constitution to the constituent assembly of Pakistan. So it's already given in the book. He admitted that he made all these contradictory promises. And now we are living with that burden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask... Uh... Uh, other people to ask questions, but uh, please, uh, within the scope of this discussion, not go beyond uh, this discussion. Uh, yes, it, it may be related, but it is not yet. So Rana Adil Akbar Saab, I have seen your hand, and then uh, we are going to uh, uh, conclude this discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Rana Saab, for giving me the chance. Okay. Uh, thank you for arranging. Thank you for arranging this. And really, Dr. Saab, uh, Dr. Stark, Dr. Uh, Hudbai, your, uh, um, with your efforts, more rational voices are raising on the events, on the sad events that happens. Actually, uh, I, I, just I say got... one word. May I say one word after this gentleman? What, just one word. Just one word. Yes, are sir. Finished, sir. Are you finished? No, he, he's uh, going to ask questions. Sir. No, he, he uh, let me just add, because this only clarifies. Why did he accept the cabinet mission plan? Because I show that on the 4th 
of April 1946, the cabinet delegation told him that Mr. Jinnah, unless you can show us how Pakistan is defensible, you know, in two different areas, we might be forced to leave India to the Congress. Then he realized that he had no choice but to accept the cabinet mission plan. Simple, I'm sorry I had to interrupt. Even that is recorded in the book with proper evidence. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, uh, may I ask a question, Mr. Amar? Yes, please, Rana. Okay, so thanks for the effort and has been done. And uh, actually, I, I'm confused now. Uh, if we see the rights, should we try for the uh, rights uh, as a human, which is separate uh, of the religion, uh, religious uh, uh, affiliation? Like, I, I want to give an example of black rights. Uh, black got the rights, Martin Luther King has done some effort, but we are still seeing they do not have the economic rights. So should we try for the economic justice or we should try to separate first the religion and state uh, from where we should start? This is one part of the question set. The second part is, is the, is the, is the, are you seeing any leader who is coming up? We are seeing in America, uh, Bernie Sanders raises to the rank where there is a possibility of progressive thoughts but is there any chance in Pakistan for this? Are you seeing anyone, any hopes on this uh, domain? Sir, Sir Pravesa. Which, which rights one should advocate? Well, it depends upon where you live. If you are living in the United States, you, I, I'm not, I'm living in Pakistan, but if I was living in the United States, I would uh, think that black rights is very important, but so is the right of people to, to uh, medical facilities, to uh, being able to educate their children and to live as civilized human beings. And so whoever is around me and is running for some political office, I will certainly try and work hard for, for them. And if there's a movement such as uh, against uh, fascism or pro-democracy or um, uh, against police brutality, I would think about joining that as well. Where you live, I don't know where you live, but uh, I'm sure that in your neighborhood, in your part of the country, there will be people who are fighting for what are universal human rights. And so be with them. If in Pakistan, it is Christians or Ahmadis who are struggling now. Ahmadis more than anybody else. Even if I don't like their religion, even if I don't believe it, I still believe that they ought to be able to live like human beings and get the same rights as anybody else. And they're being denied that at present. So yes, we must be with them for that reason alone. And so who to fight for, what to fight for, it depends upon where you are. It's universal human rights. That's what joins us, all of us. You know, each one who is present here, we are joined by this thought, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Uh, in terms of a leader for Pakistan, um, no, there's none on the horizon, but uh, we will have to work for that. There are, there are good people who are struggling everywhere. They don't have big constituencies as yet. On the other hand, Khadi Hussain Rizvi had a very big constituency. Those are discouraging matters, but uh, it'll change. Eventually, look, if you, if you go back to Europe uh, 300 years ago, that was one of the most wretched places on earth to live in. You wouldn't have wanted to go there then. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so um, can I ask uh, Wahid Bhatti, sir, uh, to please uh, uh, yeah. come to the screen and, okay. uh, yeah, and uh, start closing the session? Because it is too late. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, everyone? Yes. yes. Okay. No, thank you, everyone. I think extremely enlightening, and uh, it's always very hard to end such sessions because uh, after two hours, you feel it's just a warm up, <laughs> and the discussion is actually starting now, and wonderful questions coming up. But thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Parvez Hudbai for, for, for your comments, your input and uh, the information. Uh, 
and with the excitement you present everything, uh, with the involvement, with the enthusiasm, and I think uh, it uh, uh, answered lots of questions. And thank you to all the participants for asking wonderful questions and and taking part. Uh, just a couple of closing remarks uh, coming back to to our topic because what we started with, and of course, I mean, because when we start talking about secularism, the question goes to the roots of Pakistan and other countries. It's unavoidable. Uh, but we started off by the relationship be uh, between state and religion and is uh, how it impacts our societies. And if we uh, want to ensure equality, uh, diversity, protection of everyone, uh, equal rights and so on and so forth, is it possible to have it by not having secularism or by not having separation of the state and uh, so that's what's uh, really where we started. So what we are basically talking about that if we want uh, equal rights, equality, freedom for everyone, the neutrality of the states over all faiths is absolutely essential. Now, whether we call it secularism, we call it separation of the state, and we call it democracy, whatever we want to call it, what is absolutely critical, which is coming out of every So, so the neutrality of, of, the, of, of the state is very important towards all faiths. But what does it what does it mean? Uh, I mean, if we look at the state, which is a kind of representation of the state on the left hand side, it has to ensure freedom, equality and protection for all faiths and all religions and all races and all colors. What does this mean? These three words that the state has to ensure that to ensure a fair and, 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 and uh, society based on justice. First is the freedom, which is to practice your faith, faith or beliefs without harming others. As long as you don't interfere uh, with others, uh, you should be free to pr practice any faith or any beliefs you have. And is equality. And why? So that your religious beliefs do not put others at an advantage or disadvantage. I mean, someone because of a particular faith or because of particular color or race uh, or ethnicity should not be given an advantage or disadvantage over, over one another and the protection by the state that ethical preferences of others are not imposed. So this is why we need uh, this kind of uh, freedoms. Now, if we look at, I just, just put these three scenarios, the neutrality of the state, can it happen or can it, can it not happen with or without a state with a religion? I mean, on left-hand side, you have a state with white flag, basically with no religion. Then you have a state with a flag or with a religion, then you have another state with another religion. Now, they cannot obviously treat all faiths equally if they have their own faith. So that is basically the message in it. So to summarize, I mean, the neutrality, equality, and fairness of, of the state is absolutely essential. And I think it can be more assured under uh, separation of the state and religion rather than uh, a religious state. And the people of the same faith as the state they will always feel privileged. If the state has a particular religion and the people belong to the same religion as the state, they feel that the state is on their side and they are on the side of the state. So whatever they do, the state is always in support of them and opposed to the others who are not of, that, of the same faith. And then you open, if the state has a faith or a religion, then you open the possible misuse of religion for populist politics and we see that happening uh, I mean, everywhere. Uh, religious freedom, diversity, and tolerance, they come at risk. If a state belongs to just one sect or one religion, the other religions don't feel that kind of freedom uh, that they deserve, and the diversity and tolerance, they all are at risk. And it creates a fertile ground for polarization and extremism, extremism and we see that happening over and over again. Uh, in particular, I think people of, uh, if we look at, uh, uh, Rudbhai mentioned a lot about Pakistan, India, and, uh, and Bangladesh as well. And we have these three very different kind of uh, situations there, different kinds of societies. In Pakistan, we heard at length that, uh, that we started off uh, believing it could be secular or, really, or it could be democratic. And it was very free and liberal in the beginning but then it slowly started uh, uh, moving towards a uh, polarized and religious really state. If you look at India, it was had very solid secular foundations, but it's now under pressure. Then we see Bangladesh, it started off as a secular state, became a religious state, now again a secular state, while state is secular, 
but the society still has to, uh, to evolve to that level. Now, a question to, to uh, people living in Europe, imagine that Netherlands, France, or, or Germany, or, or Italy was to become a Repub Christian Republic. And along the lines of Israel or along the lines of Pakistan, they became the same kind of religious states practicing and imposing Christianity. How would we feel? Would we ever have had any mosques here? Would we ever have had any religious freedom here? Would we ever add Islamic schools here? No. Uh, so the question which I want to leave all of us with is, why can't we grant the same freedom to non-Muslims in Pakistan or in India or in Bangladesh, we demand for our, ourselves in the West. I think if there are any people on this earth who really, really should understand the difference between a secular and non-secular states are those who are living here in Europe. We have experienced both. We have knowledge of both. We know the benefits, advantages and disadvantages of both. So I think we, we should be at least that fair that the rights we claim for ourselves and the rights we enjoy in a secular state that we are ready to give it to, uh, to the minorities or religious minorities in particular in our own home countries. So I will end with, with Harry Blackmon's uh, quote. He said, and that primarily sums up everything, when a government puts its imprimatur on a particular religion, it conveys a message to exclusion of all those who do not adhere to the favor favored beliefs. A government cannot be premised on the belief that all persons are created equal when it asserts that God prefers some. So having said that, thank you very much. As I said, we will uh, keep the lines open for half an hour. People who missed the chance of couldn't get the opportunity to ask any question please feel free, but this will be now from now on for half an hour kind of uh, informal discussion. And thank you everyone one more time.